Welcome to the Grapevine Show. Tonight, our focus is going to be about frontline workers. These are the installers, service techs, salespeople, and everybody else. <clears throat> I do not believe we are winning the fight against the single day, one day retrofit jobs. Is it time for a new approach? Well, tonight we're going to discuss that scenario and many more with our special guest, Jim Bergman. He's got some ideas for us, maybe some new roles, some new roles for the industry, like tech efficiency specialist. This person is going to be someone who's going to identify good candidates for tuning up the system. They'll be responsible for things like heat loads, duct system analysis, and more. We're going to talk about that. Another role is the advanced residential commissioning specialist. Now, this is someone who can come in and start up the new equipment. That way, the install team doesn't have to worry about it. They're going to make sure the system runs as by design. So, not to get too carried away, because I really want Jim to go over and tell us what he's got in store for us. Talk about. Let's hear what he's got to say. To the show. <laughs> Hey, 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 Mr. Hey, hey. Jim Bergman. Hey, how you doing, Christopher? Very good. For everybody who's new here, this is the HVAC Grapevine Show. I'm your host, Chris Hughes. To my right, Eric Kaiser, Michael C. and Fracco down below, and our special guest, Mr. Jim Bergman himself. From MeasureQuick, for those who have been living under a rock. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, that's been a long, uh, a long, a long nine years now. That works yep. for Measure Quick, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay, it works good. on the uh, manual it's, input side. Yeah, I was about to say manual input. From my cold, dead hands, you shall pry this. <laughs> <laughs> or his garage. Or my, yeah, yeah. or or the the <laughs> museum on the wall. But you know, I I had to bring my technology. This is this is my technology right there, man. Yeah, technology. That's so, so Jim, it, it just has a broken Bluetooth in it, like a real tooth. <laughs> Jim, about once a year, you write an article that like shell shocks the industry, right? And that's what you've just done again. So I'd like to hear from you, like, where did this epiphany come from? Like the idea of like, maybe we got it all wrong and we need to try differently. Uh, well, I mean, I mean, last year was sort of like uh, just after it was pretty interesting because you know it's, we're at Brian Orr's event and just talking with Nate and Bill and just some of the problems that they had with their heat pumps and then we had that that stage event up there we just sort of got up and that was it was a it was a sort of a riot it was a good really good discussion about heat pumps and the whole electrification movement and a lot of, a lot of people. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of great discussion in there, but really what it came down to at the end of the day was um, we had some of the brightest people in the industry and they couldn't get their systems installed properly. And, um, you know, I talked to Nate Adams all the time and it always comes down to commissioning. And we, we talk about, you know, I mean, obviously there's, there's design elements and sizing elements and things like that. But like when you really find out your heat pump's not working, it usually is commissioning error. It usually is airflow wasn't set right, charge wasn't set right, thermostat wasn't configured properly. Um, I haven't seen anybody come back and go, "Oh man, I was way undersized." It yeah. was always it was it was always some other um, you know some other element of the commissioning. Wires weren't done right. Evacuation doesn't done right. I mean, I mean, I felt horrible for for Spone. I mean, he had multiple heat pump installations in there well, last time we we had to tear everything completely out you had to tear it all out and have a, a, a whole new heat pump put in because the type of system he put in was sort of a one and done At Bill's so it was levels. like oh yeah yeah it is uh wow. his forever home and yeah well uh, it was very interesting because we bill actually offered the installing contractors like listen i'll give you true blue hoses i'll give you 
field piece probe kit. I'll give you a vacuum pump. I'll give you everything you need to install this thing. Just please use this stuff. And the guy more or less turned him down. Man, I would put it in there for that. Didn't do the flares right. Uh, when I got there, I I, I t was taking a look at it for a bill, and it was undercharged. And as soon as I smelled the gas, I'm like, oh, this thing's just full of acid. It was just it. Mm. You know how they, when the mini splits get that green acid in them after they uh, run for a little while in a vacuum? I was going to ask and you, Jim, so, how, how long has this been installed when you came back to look in, look into that? Six months, maybe. Six okay. months or, My I don't goodness. think it was, I don't think it had been a year yet. It was, and, it was um, less than a year because it failed in the first winter of operation. Wow. Yeah. So, and Bill was, you know, I mean, and, and Bill had done everything he could do on his end to do it right. And I talked to Nate Adams too about multiple times where he had, you know, gone out and, and figured things out commissioning wise or, or, um, or sometimes it was even after the fact, like he just sh showed one where installation wise, where he'd put a heat pump in and he figured he was going to, he was going to need some more insulation, but he ended up having to insulate the basement to actually get it to keep up when it was, when it was decent weather. And it, so it, it, it all comes down to, um, uh, you know, that, that, that first year was sort of like a rant about, we're not ready for this as an industry. Like we, we, we're not installing heat. We number one, I, I would say the majority of the industry is not putting in heat pumps. We're still doing, you know, the cheapest thing, which is a split system uh, with an air handler with electric resistive heat. I mean, when you go down into Florida and you see straight, straight cooling, you just got to ask yourself what in the heck is going on? I mean, I, I go down to places like Arizona and California and texas and florida and i see more gas or as much as gas as i see in ohio and it's like what in the world's going on why are, like these areas should be nothing but heat pumps yet yeah. majority of the industry is not installing them because and and they're scared of them and it and yeah and it's it's crazy and it and it came down to um you know those types of things and then um also uh just the uh contractors that are starting to put these in are marking them up because they're scared of the callbacks they're going to get. Yeah. And there's, yeah. they're, they're scared that, you know, they're going to go out two or three times on this stupid heat pump job that they put in because it's the first one they've ever done and they don't like the technology and some consumers asking for it and they really don't want to do it, but they're going to do it anyway. And, and there's, there's so much more to go wrong. Blah, blah, blah. There's so much. Yeah. Cause yeah. it's, it's got to run twice as much now. Yeah. And you know, but if you go back to guys like uh, Joel Owen at Al Al uh, was Alabama Power, they've been doing heat pumps for like 30, 35 years. They've got some that are out there that are 35 years old that are still cranking away and mm -hmm. running as good as the day they were they were installed because yeah. they just they did a proper design, proper installation, proper commissioning, proper evacuation. Mm -hmm. And so that was that first rant. And, and so this year um, – it was pretty interesting. I was working. I have a local contractor I work with up here in uh, Ohio. Is Chad Chad Simpson Simpson Salute, and um, he's got a training lab up here in Ohio. And 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 I was sort of watching what he was doing. He was um, he was hiring new Xerox employees because they they had great customer service skills. And he's like this kind of guy, Chad. I mean, I, I've been, I've been in Chad's shop and. The cable went out and uh chad's like on the phone gets the cable guy out there and, and the cable guy's got a personality he's actually a good guy and he's like dude you should come to work for me you know and <laughs> and uh this guy's like i know nothing about hvac he goes, i don't care i'll train you you know i'll train you with measure quick so what happened was chad started hiring these guys from from xerox and not just like one or two but several of them probably enough he almost got an, a uh a restraining order for taking all their employees, but he starts bringing these guys in that have no HVAC experience and in a, about, about four to six weeks doing tune-ups. And not only are they doing tune-ups, <clears throat> but they're selling, they're selling very substantial jobs because they're not going out there with this preconceived notion that they, that they have to fix everything. They don't, they're like looking at it from a, economic standpoint of hey this thing's like 30 years old or 25 years old maybe we should put a new one in and so he had some he had in fact chad was telling me about one lady they had that she's like i'm not buying anything 
I don't want to buy anything. Just I want to tune it up. He got all the way to the end where he was actually waxing the condenser. They actually, you know, wax the condenser. And she's like, how much is a new one of these things anyway? And he's got got the sales guys out there. They quoted it and it ended up being a, um, I want to say it was like a $16,000 job on his very first call out there. Wow. So it, it was, it was, um, the epiphany really came from, not from me, but just from watching what was happening in the industry. And even, even like, you know, Valerie works for us. And, you know, I sent Valerie out in the lab. She'll go out and hook up the, the, the probes. Now she got to realize she started with us like four years ago and she had, um, she came out of the medical industry. She's got no HVAC experience. She studied chapter one, two, and three in refrigeration and conditioning technology. So she knew what the basic components were. And then she got her section 608 probably within uh, maybe the first five weeks or so she worked for me because she I told her she's going to have to touch refrigerant or something at some point. So she may as well get it. So she studied for that and took that test. And, um, now, I mean, she can walk in out of the office and she you know, looks up the probe and she goes, going, Hey, looks like the charge is a little low on the machine. And it's not that she's got all this experience with uh, assessing refrigerant charge. She can mm-hmm. hit the diagnostics flag on measure quick and see, Oh, the charge is low or the static pressure is higher. The air flows out of range or whatever else bug we've put in there. She can, she can now find that. And so the whole idea <laughs> behind these two new, um, two new roles really became from Gosh, do we really need, you know, to, to keep doing things the way we're doing them? Do we really need to do like five years or seven years of training before we can put a technician in the field to do tune-ups? Or can we leverage technology and teach a tiny subset of what we actually uh, do and change the industry? Because what I was finding was the installers want to install the service people want a service, but nobody wants to size equipment. Nobody wants to deduct system analysis. Nobody right. wants to commission. So instead of forcing people's hands, why not just bring in new workers that actually would thrive at that with a little bit of training? Yeah, when I saw your article, Jim, it, it just was like, uh, I don't know why somebody hasn't been shouting this out from the mountain earlier. It was like... Uh, I started sharing your posts everywhere. I was like, all right, where, what else do I got? LinkedIn, what else? Because it's it, it's crazy. I've been talking about what you've been talking about in that article. We need a, just, a, a, just a whole new role because, well, like you said, my, you know, the installers don't want to do more. The technicians, well, they, you know, have their role. So what do you guys Mike, think? It's, it's, I was going to say, ahead, Mike, it, it, Mike, isn't this kind of – your role like this kind of i think jim's describing what you do like you've kind of created this niche in your market where you go out and you know commission new equipment or sell the new equipment or design for it like you're playing that niche for these companies who don't have it built in internally already yeah all right i I pitched this to two companies locally and uh over time they got to see the, the you know the um just how much how much our our industry is needing what you know what we do uh, load calcs uh, you know my business does blower door and duct leakage so I'm, I'm I was doing sales it was it probably like four years ago with one company and I was like you know what I'm just gonna go ahead and do what one of these roles that what Jim is is uh, talking about I'm just gonna basically start up my own units that I sell so I'm going to pull a vacuum. I get there on site a little later. I'll pull the vacuum and I'll do the commissioning. And so I know that my customer is getting like a full commissioned job. And uh, now I also monitor some of the high end equipment through trains back website. And uh, I could do, I get emails if the system's running funny. So Jim, do you remember the days uh, I've, I'm not, I haven't been in the industry forever, but I remember the days of my dad and we having check startup sheets. Do you remember those? Like, mm-hmm. like the old yeah. school way, like when you had like, you know, five pages of everything. Uh, and this carried over for me from commercial work, like, cause my dad would send me on jobs and I'm sure somebody fed him this and then it got passed down to me. So it's not like he created them. Somebody else did a long time ago, but we would go to 
commercial equipment, do a maintenance. And it was everything, you know, what's the, what's the run right. road ants on L1, L2, L3. I mean, you had to walk your way through the whole systems and uh, man, you felt like you're there forever. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like you're pen and paper yeah. and everything. You remember those days? I can't tell you. Oh how yeah. Well, I did, I did, th I did thousands of those types of startups. I mean, but you're, you're talking about, you know, when you talk about commissioning, like what we're, what we're talking about is, is not new. I mean, if you, if you go to commercial, we usually have a design engineer that designs and selects the equipment, does a heat load calculation. We have a uh, an install an installation team that goes out there and does the installation. And then either you'll have a factory startup, which I think that's something to think about too, because factory startups are a big threat to us as uh, as uh, HVC, and not a threat. I mean, but they're they're they are a way of um, you know I can see at some point where the factory is going to say, you know what, you do the install. We're going to have a factory startup team come out and actually do the startup on the on the equipment. We did that for uh, when I worked for Train. I mean, that was very very common. People would pay for a factory startup. Yep. And it was also very common. I would go out and say, um, "You guys didn't read the manual. The piping screwed up. The ductwork screwed up. You didn't take off the shipping brackets. This and that. And I'll be back out in two weeks when you get all this stuff fixed, and we'll take a look at it again and see if we'll do the startup on it. You know, you didn't use the right kind of com wiring." I mean, it was just literally these guys wouldn't read the, read read the manual, right? And it, it's gotten to be where equipment has gotten to be so complex when it comes to um, proper commissioning and, and 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 that if you if you skip certain elements of it, you're you're going to screw it up. Um, and it it comes down to things like you know putting it in a, in a test mode when you're doing the charging or. Uh, you right. know, setting the dip switches right so you configure it correctly, uh, configuring it correctly for the thermostat for actually what you have, right? So, um, and then it's it's gotten to be where um, we've got a mis a mix match of uh, of systems and controls because you can you know have that train system with the train dedicated stat, or you can have that train system with it's a, with a third party stat and it'll it'll work two different, you know, two different ways. So it's, 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 it's challenging, but what we're doing is we're adopting or adapting something we've done in the commercial industry and putting in the, into the residential side with, I think two roles that, uh, that are more fitting. Cause I think you sort of sh like, I think we should go over the roles in a little detail, maybe of yeah, what, a, what a test and an arc does, mm -hmm. um, you know, just because I think, it's it's worth talking about in the so but the um the test the test is uh, a tech efficiency so te you know, tech hyphen efficiency specialist right and i got to thinking about well what is this person going to do well you know we, we we don't we're not getting people out there that are actually um like when we send the service guy out it's usually because it's, it's an emergency they're there for emergency service so they're either going to find a problem, fix it, or they're, um, you know, maybe they're going to sell a new unit or try and identify a, piece, a, a sale if it's a failed unit. But typically, if it's not failed, they're going to try and get it running again, right? Well, we're at a point with electrification where we actually should be looking for for equipment that's a good candidate for for electrification if if you want to go that route, right? And electrification is, you know. It's pretty much about carbon footprint reduction. I mean, it's it's really nothing more than that. There's not uh, there there are some some energy savings if you got oil or or uh, propane or fuels like that. If you're on the you got a steam boiler, you know, there's things we can do. Um, I, I would say overall, I I save a little bit on my heat pump on there, but a good candidate for electrification means that, in my opinion, is it's a good candidate for a heat pump instead of a replacement air conditioner. So we got a we got a system that Right now, it's like you know regular cooling, and um, and uh, it, it might be a good candidate for a heat pump. Well, before you do that, you got to say, well, okay, well, what do I need to know about that system? Well, first of all, is my duct system adequate? I'm a big believer, and if if you're if you're gonna if you're gonna if you're if you're gonna use an existing duct system, you're probably <laughs> further ahead to size the system for the ducts. Then you are to size the system for the house, because the the duct system is going to end up being your limiting factor on that on that a lot of the time. And so, 
you know, run, running an analysis with true flow grid and doing a, uh, and assessing what kind of capacity that duct system can have is going to put you in a, in a ballpark of, okay, now I can do my heat loss calculation, see if my duct system size properly for my home. Do I need to do a full duct renovation or can I put a heat pump on this house? and be okay can i do a heat pump with a gas furnace you know a lot of times we can we can size a smaller heat pump for the cooling load because a, a big mistake people are going to make is especially in northern climates is they're going to automatically try and size the heat pump for the heating load and and sort of discount that they could use a gas furnace that's got a higher temperature rise for the for the heating load for the for the, for the you know, major heating load and use that heat pump in the shoulder season which is what i do i use a heat pump probably 90% of the time, but that 10%, I got my gas furnace. So now that person, the test has run a, you know, a duct system analysis. They've identified, Hey, it's, it's a good candidate for electrification. I've run a duct system analysis. Maybe they've looked at things like insulation in the home. They've uh, used a product like conduit where they can walk through the LIDAR and uh, do a, a, a real quick heat loss calculation on the, on the house. They've, they've looked at things like the electrical panel. And I think, now, that's all nifty, but I want to I want you to stop and think for a minute. Now, we have technology like what we're doing in Measure Quick, where we know we'll know we're getting ready for version three is coming out here um, before the summer. Version three, we're going to have a product called Tech Tracker, uh, like Technician Tracker, that will know when your technician arrived at the job, when they deployed the probes, what probes were deployed. Um, what the what when the system is stable, when the system is scored, we'll have photos coming in as as your technicians taking the photo, they're coming back into into MeasureQuick's back end. So now in real time, I can have somebody that is um, you know Eric's like Eric or Mike's skill set sitting at the back end and saying, okay. Yep, this looks good. This looks good. Hey, wait a minute. Let's let's get another picture of this or let's look at this or that. We can have a, a set of very seasoned eyes now taking a look at this, and we can bring in the engineering team at the right point. We can bring the sales team at the right point, but nobody has to leave the office to go to the job. That's nice. So now we have these people in the field that we spend, you know, six to eight weeks with, and we teach them where to put the probes. We teach them how to follow a guided workflow. We teach them how to use TrueFlow Grid. We teach them how to use. Um, we teach them how to use a, a, a conduit. We we show them what things we want pictures taken of. Right. Um, and and if if it's not an ideal for candidate for replacement, now we're teaching them how to clean the evaporator, how to clean the condenser, how to check the filter. Their job stops at you know they're not going to pull a blower out. If it, they need to pull a blower, we need to get a service guy out here because you need a more extensive service. Right. If they have a refrigerant leak, we're going to get a service guy and they may do a refrigerant leak inspection um and maybe if there's no leak that's identifiable top off a charge because they you know a lot of systems have low charge and airflow but their their job is to you know go out on a non-emergency basis so that people can can start to consider electrification <laughs> projects without being under the duress of having to uh yeah to, to get heat back on or to get cooling back going because that's the worst time to make that decision. It, you know, Jim, that was funny. Cause it, that's basically what I did last week. I had a, had a, uh, an email notification from trains back office. It said that one of the units, uh, was like a TAM nine. It had an EEV issue. Um, so I called the office and I hit up the owner and I hit, I had told the owner, I was like, Hey man, we're having an issue with uh, this one system. He's like the funny. It's funny you mentioned that because I have a technician out there right now, changing out the EEV. So he's like, "Can you just kind of walk him through everything?" Um, I was like, "All right, I'll just send me his send me his number." So I called the I called the kid and uh, I was like, "Hey man, I just want to make sure that you're putting that into test mode when you're checking charge." He's like, "Well, how do you do that?" I was like. Just hold on one sec. Just go to the thermostat, and I got control of the thermostat, the 1050, from my laptop. So I got control of it, and I guided him. Well, this is how you do it. You go through technician access. I was like, look, we're going to put it in test mode. 
I was like, were you checking subcool when it was a normal operation? He was like, yeah. I was like, you can't do that. You got to run it into test mode. So we went through everything. I showed him how to do it, and uh, it was it was pretty cool. It was uh, it was kind of like quarterbacking from the office, you know. But, mm -hmm. um, so Jim, it sounds like um, tech efficiency specialist is kind of a all, along with other roles. It's someone who's we're positioning to kind of maybe go make sales for us, but from a tech point of view to make sales, right? It's like, hey, do you want but, something? Uh, I'd be happy to to do the homework for you early before it's a knee jerk reaction. But 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 also to to if if, if it's not you know like if it's a ten year old unit and it just needs to tune up and it's not really a good candidate now, it's just to get let's get the charge right, and let's get the airflow right, and let's get this thing running because there's 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 no no benefit for a consumer in changing equipment earlier than it needs to be changed, right. you know, right. unless, unless they're yeah, just hungry to do that. But the thing is, is that again, with like this test role is we're going to, we're going to send somebody out with a subset of the tools. They don't know, they don't need to know how to solder or braze. They don't need how to, how to do sheet metal. They don't need to have all the installation stuff on there. They're not picking up and setting units. They're not, you know, this is literally something you can run out of the back of a Prius, right? Yep. Yeah. I mean, they, they 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 may have some coil cleaner. They may have a a little uh, subco pressure washer, some little things to do some some small maintenance work on there. They may have some mastic or some sealant or things like that, uh, some wire ties. But but they're not going to get into. They they don't need they don't need a truck full of parts. They need a just a subset of the tools that are that are out there to get the job done. And right. we've actually we've we've seen this done in uh, like uh, I've seen Raiders in California that literally run out of a Prius. They can store everything they need in the back of a Prius. So this this is very um, very doable with a with a with a subset of the tools and a subset of the expense for a company. But then these these technicians because they're identifying sales, they end up being actually a huge asset to the company when it comes to the jet the dollars that they potentially generate because they're 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 like a, mm -hmm. a a salesperson that's more of an advocate for the consumer than somebody that's going in when the consumer's under duress and trying to um to buy the unit so and there's people starving to know more about electrification right now so something i'm hearing here like th that we're talking through these different positions right and right? They're positions, but I think even more so than a position that they're a mindset. Yeah. Right. It, it's a, it's a different mindset when that person walks in to talk to the customer. Yeah. Cause you're right, man. Yeah. I mean, technicians that have 20 years, in, <clears throat> like usually when we talk to people about home performance and this, that, and the other thing, we almost have to work our way back out of being a technician. So starting fresh, right? You know what I? You know what I'm hearing? I'm hearing uh, that the owner's going to get a break because what Jim, as you were talking, all I could think about was days where uh, technicians would call me and I'd have to like stop what I'm doing or wrap it up, get over to this job because I need to go make the sale because I was the one who knew the the pricing right. books or I knew how to you know take this job, sell the duck upgrades to go with it, and it's like you know when you know the whole chessboard you become the guy who has to go make this sell that sell. But what you're yeah. saying is you basically have a person who's not doing all of these tasks and they're focused on the efficiency side and tune-ups. That person probably could build the skill set to also kind of handle sales for the owner. Yeah. Well, that's right. the idea. So this is something that's that's a little bit more mm -hmm. outgoing that's got some, you know, like and these are people like I'm telling you, these are people I would pull from from retail, if, if I found a person at Home Depot or I found a person at, at a restaurant or a good waitress that just had some that had some good people skills and a personality mm -hmm. and somebody I could train to, to talk to people like like, like we are 80,000 people short in our workforce. So the Let's and, start and it's stealing. Very, yeah. But, <laughs> but, 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 but the thing is, is that we here's something we, we never had in the last, you know, 50 years, we've never had technology that is going to enable a workforce to actually become successful in a, in a very, very short period of time 
and provide a lot of value and and also get data back from the field to the person that they need to get support from. It's like this is we're, we're on steroids now when it comes to being able to actually gather and share the data in ways that we've never been able to do it before and get it to the right person that can help make the right uh, the right choice. And then this test would also be somebody that would be um, uh, aware of all the state and uh, federal uh, rebate programs that are available. They would, you know, I mean, think about trying to tra train, uh, you know, 40 technicians about all the state and rebate programs that are available for heat pumps and yeah. put 40 true flow grids and 40 trucks and 40 yeah. measure quick kits and 40 trucks versus just Thank being able to send send them out with a subs, you know, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's like, yeah. The, the, yeah, techs don't want to hear about rebate programs. They just don't like, that's not what gets them exactly. up in the morning and makes them want to go to work. You know, they want to go, right. a tech wants to go to the job, get something accomplished, get it running and feel like, like a major goal has happened that day. I got them people, their air back and working today. Like I'm yeah. a hero yep. today. And the idea of talking about a rebate to a homeowner, it, it you know, they, it's direct, it's sales in their mind. And they're like, I don't want to be a salesman. I didn't take this job to be a salesman. And I get I've that. heard that so many times from time. so, <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, I mean, and yeah, but that's a, that to me is a mindset because I don't care what we do. As a technician, as a, a, a salesperson, whatever, we have to sell something in order to stay in business, in order to make a living. I was Everybody has you. to sell I was something. with you as of last week. Uh, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> this new role, man. I mean, we gotta. I think Jim's on to something. But, but I, I think if you get big I'm enough, you, you don't have to. There's plenty of I, companies that have install teams. Those guys aren't selling anything. They go to work every day. They barely yeah. talk to any. They barely talk but to each other. They <laughs> you know they still have to show up. Number one, they have to sell themselves to their employer. Right. Yeah. That is selling saying. something to someone. Now, it might not be in the traditional <laughs> sense of a salesperson. But no, I mean, I think you're talking about professionalism. They're showing up with professionalism. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know if that's the same thing as sales. And Eric, I'm with you, I, man. I've told technicians. Oh, well, this. like, come over here, I, bro. You, you have to, if you make money for the boss, you make hours for yourself. And, you know, I'm with you, Eric, but. Dude, I yeah, hit a wall after a while. I know. You know, it's it's guys, a mentality wall. They're technicians, man. You yeah. Know? Well, it's 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 also it's also you got you got to remember is technicians and installers sell what they're comfortable with. So yeah. mm -hmm. they're they're gonna they're gonna sell you. You know you know what they're gonna tell you. You know what? I just put in that regular ninety plus single stage unit because it's it's simple. It just works. It's easy to install and they're, they're not going to talk to you about a VRF heat pump. They're not going to yeah. talk to you about the no. top of the line train system, the communicating system, because they, and, and that's where we're falling down. I mean, yeah. there, we, we, we technicians and, and installers t tend to have a lot of empathy. Um, and, and they tend to think out of their own, like they, they, they think that their wallets, their consumer's wallet. And that they're because they wouldn't spend a few dollars to to have a, a top of the line system that neither would their consumer, and that since um, you know that that thing was a frustration for them, that'll yeah. be a frustration for the for the consumer. So, I think it's it's um, it's it's really it's really challenging when we're talking about bringing people into the industry that that are not um, professionals at sales that cannot remove themselves a little bit from what they know to, to, to offer suggestions that are to the consumer that are maybe a little bit beyond what we would do normally that I think we're, we're missing the opportunity for some really, really big, you know, big sales there. So the test is a, it's, it's a really important role. Um, but then I, I think what's, you know, here's, here's the thing. So I was working with another, uh, uh, company, uh, Ray O'Cook, um, Paul McHugh out of uh, California. And Paul was telling me, um, uh, you know, he said, we, we, he's a long time measure quick customer. They've been, they do measure quick on every single job. And he's like, he's like, yeah, he goes, I goes, I quit having my installers do it. I have my uh, installers do the initial configuration, but I have uh, my service guys go out in the shoulder season and we actually 
uh, commissioning units. My installers just get them up and running. We make sure they're safe. We do some basic preliminary checks. We check combustion. We check the temperature split. We make sure it's got some subcooling. But then after the after the house has settled down a little bit, because a lot of times they're doing startups, it's hot in the afternoon or really humid or whatever. It's outside of conditions. Because it's either you know a week or a month or whatever time frame they they get somebody back out there and they actually do the the commissioning. And uh, and that was sort of the inspiration for the for the uh, for the for the arc. Along with, I have a background in commercial, you know, uh, startup work. Right. But uh, the the arc is, you know, we look at all these failures we have. Um, you know, I, I know people love to complain about evaporator coils and things like that. And you know, I guarantee you, copper's gotten thinner. I mean, there's no question about it. It's it's thinner than it was when we we're doing uh, our R22 and R12 systems. And mm -hmm. uh, but copper is failing. Like when you when you see somebody put dye in a system and you pull the cover off the evaporator and you shine a black light on there, and it and it looks like it's leaking from everywhere. It's got all these little microscopic ulcers. Right. That is not a manufacturing defect. That is a victim of improper evacuation, system made acid, acid attack the copper, form of carrier corrosion. We are getting a lot of crappy copper out from all over the country, all over the world now, and, and it's not as pure as it used to be. So there's imperfections in the copper. It that form of carrier corrosion eats those little imperfections out, and we end up with this coil that's got microscopic leaks coming from everywhere. And we can avoid that with just proper evacuation on the system and a proper decay test to make sure that we don't have moisture in the system. And then we already know, you know, they just had that Building America study, like 20% of systems had correct charge or something like that. 30% had airflow over 350 CFM per ton. Airflow and refrigerant charge problems are, are rampant. And if we, if we just went in and corrected those, how many, how many callbacks, how much, how much could we avoid serv servicing what we sell? And um, I think that's also important. Like, like if I, if I own a company, I don't want to service a piece of equipment that I have sold for the first three to five years that it's been installed. And on a on a typical job, you do not need to clean a condenser yearly. I would say, unless you're in an area like where cotton flies, you have some like uh, you know heavy pollen or something like that. Three to five years is the first time you really need to clean the condenser. It's where it's going to finally load up enough. It's going to actually cause some issues. Three to five years is when you start to need to maybe look at the evaporator, make sure that the evaporator doesn't need clean. You know, annual filter replacements, that kind of stuff. But if the consumer is doing the basic maintenance, we shouldn't have to touch a piece of equipment for the first couple of years of operation because it just there's no there's there's no benefit. We real, honest to God, should, like once it's charged. Uh, it's, it's one and done. We don't charge again until we decommit hey, the system. Hey, hey, Jim, hit your earbuds for me. I, they're, you're cutting out real bad on my end. Yeah. All right. Is my mic any better? No. Is this sound still bad? Okay. You want me to go to I, my audio in my it's, – you want me to try it? Yeah, yeah it's, you're break, it's breaking yeah. out. How's this, guys? A little bit better? Tap that mic real quick, Mike. Yep, it's there working now. Does that work any better? Yeah, that's fine, Jim. Yeah. Uh, so I was curious, right. could you give us a rundown on the uh, like the action items that the person below would be, like an advanced residential commissioning specialist? Like, what is their, what's going to be their daily routine? So the the commissioning specialist would be somebody to go in behind all your installation team. So let's say, you know, I always joke installers want to install, so they want to do the mechanical parts of the installation. They want to set the equipment, they want to attach the line set, they want to attach the duct work, they want to attach the thermostat, maybe do the thermostat wiring. But at, at the end of the day, like most of your installers, they have it down so at 3.30, they're starting to pick up their tools and they are ready to roll out the door and they're mentally done. I mean, it's it's gotten to the point where we have, um, we, we have these guys sort of ingrained in the work where Equipment was really simple. We didn't really have a, a lot of startup process that, with it. I mean, it used to be the older equipment. You could you could you could get away with flipping on the switch and walking away, and it was fine. It it would, it would run for five years without too much too much going wrong. But today, there's a commissioning process where 
charged airflow are, are more critical than ever. Static pressures are more critical than ever. The equipment doesn't have, you know, it's not like our PSC motor is just going to back down. You're going to have low airflow. You're going to eat up an ECM motor. You're going to, you're going to eat up an evaporator coil. You're going to, you're going to ruin something in very short order if you don't, if you don't commission it properly. So the idea behind the, the, the arc is that, that the installers got everything put in and now we're going to send out a fresh set of eyes to actually do the commissioning. They're going to look at the, they're going to look at the filter installation. They're going to make sure the filter's not getting bypassed around it. They're going to look at the, at the ducts, make sure the ducts are sealed. They're going to look at the, the things like the, the gas line and make sure the gas line's got a, is, is properly trapped, properly installed. Make sure the flu, the, the, the flu pipe is pitched properly. Make sure it's got the correct number of screws in it. Um, visual inspection, high level visual inspection of all the things that you would look at in the, in the manual. At the same time, they're going to do the evacuation. So again, we're talking about a subset of tools. So nobody's got to have a torch. Nobody's got to do duct work. Nobody's got to have, uh, equipment to, to load the, lug the equipment around. Nobody's got to have concrete or anything else. They're, they're going out there to do the startup on the equipment. So they, they have, again, true flow grids. They're going to make sure that they're going to get that airflow dialed in correctly. They're going to make sure that the static pressures are, are um, falling within the, in the, in the safe range that they don't have an undersized return or an undersized supply. They're going to make sure that the, that the charge is correct. And then they're going to guarantee delivered BTUs. It's so important. You know, it's, it's one, it's, we test a lot of the equipment and the equipment will usually perform. What are those BTUs actually getting delivered to the space? Do we have uh, any any substantial heat loss or heat gain in a duct system that are causing issues, um, you know, uh, uh, and this could be things too. Like when we look at, you know, people are always think about just heat loss and heat gain, but are things like register boots sealed? I don't know how many times I've seen heat getting pulled out of an attic, getting entrained by a register yeah. because the register boots not sealed, and we're pulling hot at 140 degree air from the attic and and entraining it into the supply airstream. And we end up with with um, you know this huge loss of capacity on a on a majority of the registers because improper installation techniques. So the the idea behind the arc is that they're going to make sure for the contractor that the consumer gets the, the, the system properly commissioned, but that they don't get that callback. Right. And you know we think ah oh, it's just a callback. You know it's just a truck roll. Well, that truck roll comes with opportunity losses where you could be doing other things but it also comes with all the social media uh you know crap that follows along with it of i'm not happy with my new system i just spent you know twenty thousand or sixteen thousand or whatever those google yeah. reviews are strong man <clears throat> oh, yeah it, one one bad review just destroyed a hundred good ones you know oh, yeah no and it God. takes you and how much time and effort do you spend to get that right with that customer to get them to change that review right. to something that's more that's more positive. So the arc, the idea behind the arc is that, you know, the, the installers, the installer can no longer get the, they cannot get the system installed and commissioned in a day. We just need to get that mindset out of our way that, yeah, we can install it in a day, no problem, but we can't install it and properly commission it. And we know that because commissioning is not getting done. And we know that because we have charge and airflow problems. <clears throat> and we know that because we have substantial amounts of warranty issues so let's again bring a worker in and you know what we have to do we, we may have to charge a little bit more for that worker for that truck roll. you may have to charge yeah. another three to five hundred dollars for that commissioning but it's going to be a huge benefit to the consumer and a huge benefit to the uh to the um uh to the equipment manufacturer and a huge benefit to the company isn't it funny how arc which is the person who kind of follows up on the team sounds a lot like narc no it's not funny. <laughs> no no it's not funny at all yeah so i i got another yeah. question in here jim so uh, something that i see a lot right is people consumers especially um they'll wait till things 100 percent break down in the middle of the summer in the middle of the winter it's cold it's hot um and they're saying, Hey, we got to get this fixed tomorrow. We got to get this changed out tomorrow. We got to have this done right now. Yep. 
is there a, a what what position or what person would you say should be talking to that consumer and saying, hey, let's get together before this happens, and maybe we have a plan, maybe yeah. we have a, a size in mind, maybe we have a design already laid out so mm-hmm. that when your equipment does fail, because it's not if it's going to fail, it's a matter of when. That's yeah. with every equipment. We say, hey. We can have this all set up and ready for you. You've got a packet. We'll keep a copy of it. You know, you pay for it. You get a copy. We get a copy. That way, when it's time to go, we can just use this design to, to select new equipment and drop it in at that point in time. Yeah, I can, see, there... that. I can see that happening. Yeah, you because, know, you know, again, now I, I think what's really important is these new two roles do not displace current workers. We're not trying to replace service people. We're not trying to replace installers because the the service person is there for the emergency they're the when we say frontline workers they're they're the emergency room technician that's going to get in and get people out of a bind and you know if they need a new heart they need a new unit they're going to they're going to get the sales guy out there and they're they may have to do a like for like replacement but they're going to they're going to still be out there doing doing their at functioning their highest level installers still going to be out there doing the installation but you're right. Now, this is where the, the service guy now can go out and say, Mrs. Jones, your system's 25 years old. Why don't you let us send out a tech efficiency specialist to do an analysis of the home? See if you're a good candidate for electrification. Um, and we'll we'll come together with a little bit of a design for you so you can put that system in. Uh, when, when, when you're ready, we're ready to go. And, and we got it designed and you're not under pressure and you got an idea what it's going to arrange and maybe what it's going to cost you. Uh, to do this type of, of work and also an idea of what your payback might be. And, you know, and, and then, you know, the, the, the arc becomes a lot easier because I think that somebody we can, we can schedule to come out there uh, behind them. But the, I think the test really becomes a, a, an integral role when it comes to um, a pre, pre-planning, which we don't do, we don't do enough of, um, you know, it's uh uh, when we're when we're under duress, the first thing w- that we want to do is a like for like replacement, and we just end up with the same with the same problems for another for another for another twenty years, right? And can can we avoid that? Right. Yeah. yeah. Another thing I would say, Jim, is the two roles that you're defining. Um, they could be powerhouse players for a company, and if you think about like the age of the technician, the daily technician today. Um, they're not going to be able to do installs forever, right? It's hard on the body. These two yep. roles, I mean, they're they're physical, but they're not as physical as the install team uh, and some of the service work that's being done. So this would be a good fit for somebody who's very well-rounded in the company. Let's say a very, very good service technician or installer who's ready to, you know, not break his knees every day anymore. Right. Uh, yeah. He's looking I, for an opportunity. I didn't opportun- even think about that. That's a great idea. Yeah, well, it's a it's a good fit though too for that. It's it's a good fit for that for that uh, for that person that's at the at the restaurant that's got a great personality and it's got some yep. sales skill or or somebody that you know you run across. This, I mean, it, what's very interesting with this is, and I think this is where I want to go back to is, this is about leveraging technology that we've never had the opportunity to leverage before to bring additional workers into our workforce. I mean, it's cool. We could repurpose things and people could get new jobs and that kind of stuff. But the way that we're going to fix our industry is to bring in some new people in. And I think this is where the test and the arc roles can lead to service and installation roles also. So now, you know, we bring them in, teach them where to place the probes, how to do a basic analysis of an air conditioning system, that would make an easy transition in four or five years to service because you've seen enough things now right. in a couple of years that you could actually become a service person. Yeah. Um, you've got you've got somebody at the back office that can assist you and walk you through a problem to fix it if if you have the you know parts and stuff on to fix it or a broken wire connection or whatever. It's it's like we can we can now take these people in an eight to ten weeks. Let's think about this in eight to ten weeks. Put a person in the field with some probes that actually can, um, you know, generate revenue for a company that is actually an yeah. asset instead of a liability that's that's selling these high-end jobs that everybody wants to sell. And then we have the ARCs coming in behind them that's eliminating a lot of the, the rest the contractor has when it comes to actually getting the stuff set up, commissioned, and running right. Yeah. And I think, you know, all of us know 
I mean, because we're all sort of the, the nerdy guys that have all the high-end equipment and all this good stuff that all of us know that if you put the stuff in right, it just it just runs. Yeah, it, it, you just put it in, it just works. <clears throat> like, there's nothing to be scared of with 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 the high-end equipment. Magic. It, it it does what it's supposed to do. It's they're actually engineered pretty darn well. Yeah, it's, I'd agree. Commissioning that's the issue. I I remember I can't remember where I seen this. Mike, maybe you sent me something, and the guy oh, was complaining yeah. about uh, all on. these high end units shouldn't be. We shouldn't be putting these Thank in you. in the south because they're super problematic. I have had, and I love that very, guy. By the way, I've had very little problems out of the communicating inverter based equipment in my market. I just and, haven't had problems. And dude, I monitor all of my <laughs> inverter based systems online. I get to watch their run times. And yeah. they've been they've been pretty reliable, man. You I've know, compared had, to single speed. I I've been fortunate. I can't remember. The only thing I remember dealing with a lot, and I think this is a equipment problem. I'm not gonna get deep into brand or nothing, but two stage equipment. I was having issues with compressors that just wouldn't they okay. would trip the uh the amp limit for some reason. And I remember going through a spill on that. And finally, I just, the way I nixed it is I just took two-stage out of the game. Because I started saying, why am I even offering two-stage? I'm going to either yeah. go, go high-end single-stage or inverter. There's that's, no in-between. That's where that guy I tagged you on Facebook is with, with inverters. He's like, no, oh, I'm not going to do it. It's too complicated, yada, yada, yada. He was on a rant. And he's I was a say, smart guy. In my opinion, I think two-stage is more annoying than an inverter would be. Well, two stage is good for for comfort. I mean, it it is a it's a poor man's inverter system, I guess. Yeah. yeah. But it, you know, after um, after having the inverter heat pump, I have that that Bosch unit, and um, I tell you what, I'm a I'm a I'm a huge fan of it. My my wife um, actually does not like when the gas furnace comes back on because the comfort in the house actually decreases. That's I'm in awesome. Ohio, and we're in a northern climate. I mean. I've run that heat pump. I can run it down to 15. I haven't found the balance point on it yet. What's amazing to me is I figured out how oversized or how much oversized for oversizing equipment, because I mean, at, at 15 degrees out, I maintain at 72 degrees in my house with the 36,000 BTU heat pump. I have a 90,000 BTU furnace because at the time that was the smallest uh, furnace I could get with a three ton drive for the full modulation. And it modulates down to 35,000 BTUs, which I thought at the time was really cool. But now I realize I only need a fraction of that most of the year. And I don't think I need 60,000 BTUs uh, on my house ever um, for, for heating. And I'm at, you know, 3,000 square foot, which includes my walkout basement, um, and I, I have a lot of glass, and you've been up to my house, Chris. I have a lot mm -hmm. of glass. I live on the lake, so then I mean, we have all the air coming off the lake. What's and the blower door, Chris? Come on. All uh, I'm gonna say is, man, Jim has a very comfortable house. I, I've, I've got my blower door was average, average, average okay. leakage. Cool. Yeah. Um, so it's it's very interesting because when the guy came out, he said, "Yeah, you could spend about you know maybe three thousand dollars to do some air sealing, do that kind of stuff to save about thirty five dollars." A year and uh, yeah, right. And in cost, I'm like, yeah, I don't think so. So, but the equipment, the equipment itself, um, is 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 amazing, and um, you know, overall cost is about the same. But my comfort is through the roof. I mean, that's that's, that's the cool. big thing with the heat pump. Yeah. I would have never anticipated the comfort. And now, where I do save a boatload is cooling. My cooling bills are fifty percent of what they were. Um, Hmm. So the heat pump for heating cool. is apples for apples, but on cooling is where I'm really, I'm rocking savings on that. I, I had the same thing on my old house with my dual fuel system. Um, and it was only a, I had a two stage furnace and a single stage um, heat pump. And I ran that single stage 14 sear, you know, basic heat pump down to about 20 degrees uh, because that's when I would start to lose temperature in the house. But as soon as it switched over, man, did the comfort go downhill. Even if, even running that furnace on low stage, and it was a 60,000 two-stage furnace, mm -hmm. so you know that thing was running, you know, 28,000 or whatever probably. Yep. Um, but, 
oh man, the comfort just got terrible in there. And so I wish that, that I had, you know, I wish I had the equivalent inverter. of having like um, 15 KW heat strips and then putting like a heat pump in later on. <clears throat> I'm from Florida, man. So well, yeah, yeah. yeah well, uh, I'd, I'd have to run the calculations on it. But and like yeah. Jim, so your heat pump, if you've got a three ton boss, you're probably putting out at 15 degrees outdoor, you're probably putting out around 25,000 BTUs. Uh, I'm guessing. Yeah, maybe around there. I'm not sure. It's not, it, it's it, the inverter overruns a little bit. I'm not sure what, I haven't looked at the performance on that, but it's, I don't know how far back down it goes, but it, I imagine it's close to 30, 28 oh, to really? 30. Wow. I mean, so, it's at, at 17, that unit's rated at 25 because I've got, yeah, I've yeah. Looked, I, I've I, looked I at those a lot. Okay, I've yeah. got a question. Uh, and this one goes to Jim, but kind of everybody the same if you want to chime in. So, the yeah, far like, as speaking like of quick, yeah. <laughs> load calculations is where I'm going with this. Do you think the future is going to be that homeowners are going to provide their own load calculation to the person showing up? I mean, I don't know if you guys have played around with it. I know, you know some of y'all have, but like, Quick Model's about to release a really cool thing where Cuba Casa will scan the house. You you port the load into Quick Model. It builds a 3D model. That's It's not exactly going to be homeowner DIY friendly at that point, but close. Right. And Conduit, I think, is working something close to the same. I, I haven't played with that one personally yet, but, you know, Eric, you might have. I'm not sure. but A little, a little bit. not only, <laughs> at a, only at some of the shows. I haven't had anything in my hands yet. I'm just wondering, do you think in the next, say, five years, are we going to have homeowners running their own load calculations? Uh, I would say it could come off the – I think we're going to do a, a deaggregation of electrical and uh, bills and uh, figure it out with the electrical bill and figure it out with a thermostat. I think I think eventually we're going to be looking at run times and, and actual gas and actual electric usage and be able to, like, isolate those loads off and be able to – you know, get a good idea of what the what the true heat loss um, of the home is. So you're thinking that the future is going to be everybody has a smart thermostat and we're going to have energy based loads. Well, maybe in in uh, in 60, 70 years, you know, right now, I think, you know, if you think about the brand new single stage equipment we're putting in today, it's got 15 to 20 years of life before it's replaced. Um, so the cool thing is like like you know people always ask me like with measure quick are you worried about um are you, are, you, are you worried about the equipment manufacturers coming out with all this communicating equipment like the train equipment that michael works on it's like no i mean that's like one or two percent of the market and yeah, so when you're talking is. about you know these high-end eco b thermostats or or you know whatever kind of thermostat you want to put on there um <clears throat> you're only talking about just a a, a sliver of the market that's going to do it so will we have the technology absolutely will it be perfect probably not i got something to say to that um just because they report it doesn't mean you should take it as truth you know what i mean i've uh i've tested some equipment what, that what do you what are you saying report what chris i'm, I'm saying you're talking you about what these communicating systems and the data that's coming out of them Yes, I'm. I think it depends. I think it depends on what data you're looking at coming out of them. Right. Yeah. I agree. Like we just I had was, a guy on LinkedIn complaining about this. Well, I think in our minds we think multi-billion-dollar company. They got it all figured out. They spent all this time on getting the the parameters right and the algorithms right. And I have come to find that's very much not the case all the time. I'm not saying it's bad everywhere, but I have definitely found my fair share of anomalies where I'm like you know, go on my thermostat settings and I'm like, wait a minute, where's the settings that used to be there? Oh, they've changed them. There's been an over there update. Well, crap, that's missing now. Well, they tried something new. And then like six months later, I may find a problem, fix a sensor, go back. And I'm like, wait, that setting's gone now. What the hell's going on? You know, I mean, all I'm saying is not to mention we've tested airflow on some units that reported flow and we've come to find that they don't line up. So, oh, yeah, you know what I'm saying? That's right. You just got to be careful. You've got to remember they're probably not going to report something that's not in their best interest. Right. Well, and, and, and they, they make, I mean, all this is done by humans. People make mistakes and, and uh, you know, it's, it, 
when we're still seeing, I mean, I still see some manufacturers making heat pumps with demand defrost on them, you know, and they have a, they have a board that they could do anything, but, but they you, don't you mean, enable you mean that. Time and, you mean time and temperature? Yeah. Time and temperature. I'm sorry. Yeah. Instead of okay. demand defrost. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Time and temperature defrost. Brand new heat pumps, time and temperature defrost. Wow. Yeah, I agree a hundred, a hundred percent on that because that is ridiculous. It is just a ridiculous defrost. Nothing gets you out of bed in the morning, like a fan blade chopping ice. Yeah. (laughs) But I mean, it's, it's, um, you know, we're, we're, we're going to see, I mean, the industry is changing and the technology is changing faster than we can, uh, than the the technicians can change. And I think, again, that's goes back to why do we need these two new roles? Right. And it's, and it, and if it, it doesn't take a lot to embrace these roles because we we already we already we have all the tools we have all the technology we have you know uh, literally uh, true tech tools can put together a kit tomorrow for this right. and, um, and 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 I've already seen multiple contractors doing it so it it really like I said it's not about me discovering something new it's just about me sort of putting it in paper and it just so happened to be that. It was a year after uh, a year after my heat pump rat. It wasn't. Uh, I do right. write more than once a year. Let, let me ask this, Jim. I mean, I know we're getting close to the end of the show here, but let me ask this. So, you started out talking about, um, you know, how the shortage of technicians that we're looking at in the in the um, um, industry, and you you were spot on in your article. It's not a it's not a crisis. It's an endemic because. Mm-hmm. They were talking about this 20 years ago when I got in the trade. They, oh, we're going to have this shortage of technicians. Well, what the heck have we done about it? Well, quite honestly, if you look around, almost every single trade or, uh, you know, so many places are short of workers right now. Like, we yeah. just don't have enough workers in our society to be able to fill these roles. So what are these two new roles going to do to help contractors – overcome their problems with a shortage of workers because you're now you're talking about putting new roles in is that going to require new people or what well, what are your thoughts on that no that's where i'm going eric is that we we go outside of our industry we bring we bring new people in it's not about repositioning our current workforce it's not right. about re-leveraging them and retraining them and and we've already tried that i mean we, we i've been working with measure quick for seven years now and for us to fully onboard a company, you know, that's like a 600 to thousand technicians takes a year, right? Cause we got a, they got a huge capital expense to bring all these tools in and retool all these guys. Well, we could do it. Like if you didn't have every one of your installing teams buying a measure quick kit, right? We could, we could do it with probably a 10th of the tools and a 10th of the talent and get, and get those 10 guys out there just doing startups for, for, you know, for a hundred install crews. Um, so it's, it's, it's about, you know, realistically what I want to see happen or what I, what the way I envision this all happening is that, um, we, we have, we have people that, that, that are getting displaced through, uh, AI. We have a lot of technology workers getting displaced right now. We have, a, we have a lot of, uh, of people that are looking at retail jobs that just aren't paying what they want to, that they want to pay. We have a lot of, you know, Amazon shutting down a lot of the uh, department stores and things like that. We have we have workforce available. They just aren't an HVAC trained workforce. So where I see this happening is we identify the people that have the people skills. That so, if if I was if I was setting up a, um, and I would find two types of people. I would find people that are uh, eccentric that you know like to go out and talk to people, like to sell, like to uh, talk to people about new technologies. And I would find the introverts that are the people that want to that want to read the manual, start the equipment up, and you know focus on 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 the details, the detail work. And yep. these are again like these are great job for for women. My, like my wife is super detailed when it comes to um, like our finances or or uh, you know how processes or how to do something or how to she, like she follows a recipe and you know oh, I don't follow any recipe. I just throw shit together, you know. But she's in there, <laughs> she's following every step of it. It requires, you know, uh, 0.2 grams. She's putting in 0.2 grams or whatever in there. Jim, you can't put bourbon in everything when you're cooking, all right? Oh, yes, you can. <laughs> all, right. all right, sold. Yeah, so, but, I mean, it's, it's we, we have to start looking outside of our workforce, and this is where it's so cool is we have, 
now tools to do that. And we can yep. bring people in and get them successful in weeks or even, you know, not even months, like literally weeks. If we can just teach them where to put the probes, teach them some yep. basics. I mean, if, if, if I'm telling you, if, if, if my, have you gone down and, and tried to run your Samsung washing machine? If, you, if, if your wife can run a Samsung washing machine, she can commission a trained furnace. Right. All right. Tell I'm telling you, that thing is, yeah. it's got more ding buttons on it and more, and, and, uh, it, it takes more configuration yeah. than my, than my furnace does. I can never figure out how to run the washing machine down there anymore. It's just, and I'm not, I'm not that old. I can't do it. It's just the technology has gotten beyond my skill set. Yeah. Right, and, I, and I've personally, I've personally tried to talk to installers. I personally try to talk to technicians. Dude, just download this free app. Come on, let's get on a train. Let's let's do better. And um, I just feel like they're a little overwhelmed. I feel like these two new positions are going to be awesome for the industry. Well, I, I, I really, I really do too. And the um, the thing is, is, it it doesn't take us long to get there. So right, you know, we're at Measure Quick. We're setting up a whole. We're actually doing a work, uh, Measure Quick Workforce. We got a, a placeholder web, a website, MeasureQuickWorkforce.com, MQWorkforce.com. Um, we're going to start uh, doing this type of, of training, um, and uh, we've already written up curriculum for it. I've actually been working on this for about six months now, uh, writing a course of study, writing up curriculum, uh, uh, working through the details of uh, designing the two roles out and what they are. But I mean, at, at a high level, you could you could literally implement this tomorrow at your company. It, it doesn't require all the things that uh, that we that we're putting in place to, to, to. I think just what you've learned in this podcast is enough to to get you a, a flavor of what the roles would do and figure out how you'd incorporate those into your into your company. And I apologize, Jim, because I've had Measure Quick since you guys launched it, and um, I always go to the old school version. But you're telling yep. me the the new. The new app will actually be like our cloud is for retro tech. It'll yeah, it'll we're just, we're doing a whole cool. V three, and that's gonna it's it, have you ever, you know like on an iPhone when you when you do a text message, you can see the other person replying. Right. Those are called web sockets. So now as as you work in Measure Quick, we're sending data back in real time to the to a helper at the other end of the desk where they can they can see what you know see where you're at in the process. Right. When the system's stable, how it scored see the photos in real time. We're also doing a, a product called test uh, called tool tracker where we can see where you last used the tool. So if you leave a tool on the job, we'll know oh, when it was last so connected to measure quick and oh, give you the location to go back and get it. I mean, that's worth that the price of admission right there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we, we've Especially got. Especially the air probes, man. Like, oh, oh my God. Yeah. So we're, we're doing um our, our V3 launch is going to be, incredible we we're doing all new frameworks updating the user interface uh we just rolled in uh yellow jacket probes in um so their their line of probes is in so i think we've got almost every major manufacturer of uh probes in the industry now but the um uh it's it's going to be v3 will, will be very cool it's gonna it what we what we found out was um you know it's very interesting when you design software like this is you is we really designed it for technicians, but we found out our our primary user is actually service managers. Our, our best clients wow. are service managers because the service manager is the one that sort of has the ear of the owner that has got the ability to spend some money and implementing right. technologies, but they also have all the problems with the technicians and all the headaches the technicians have, and they have this need to get data. So now so, you hold them accountable. So we backed up and we said, you know, we got to <laughs> better tools for service managers so that they can better interact with their guys in the field and better assist them in the field. And then obviously service managers, also tech support people, uh, you know, right. people that are going to give you that kind of stuff. But yeah, we're, we're, we're cranking away on, uh, on, uh, on, on redesigning the product for, uh, um, for, for all new, for new use cases for the tests, for the arc for the, for the uh, service manager. Um, you know, trying to really, really change the industry for the better. It's, uh, it's been a labor of love, but, um, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, I've, I've enjoyed this thing since we started and I can't believe it's been, we've had measure, we've had the company up for nine years. Now we've been working on measure quick for seven years and it seems like wow. a blink of an eye. 
feels so, like yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's been amazing how slow these smaller companies want to change. It's, it's, it's blue. It blew well, my mind. And that's, time that's why we got to put new roles in. Yeah. Yep. Time, time flies when you're having shift. fun, Jim. Yeah, it does. Yep. Yep. Jim, thanks for coming on. Oh, thank you guys. Appreciate it. Well, Wealth of knowledge. I'm really upset Waffles couldn't make it, but that's fine. Yeah, he's 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 down there with the bowl of bourbon. He's laying on the floor on his back, legs <laughs> up in the ground. Yeah.